Four million babies are born in the United States each year. More than 5,000 arrive with a genetic or metabolic condition. By obtaining a few drops of blood through a heel prick collection, babies can be screened for these conditions during the first few days of life. The result could mean early detection and treatment of conditions that otherwise could cause irreversible neurological damage, coma, or death. Every day, healthcare professionals throughout the country collect blood spots from babies. The specimen is then sent to the public health laboratory to be screened for at least 29 different conditions. However, without following the correct procedure of collecting these samples, laboratories cannot process the results properly, which potentially delays vital treatment for newborns. Laboratory scientists can answer many of the questions that may arise during the blood spot collection and offer important information to help ensure specimens arrive at the lab ready for screening. Why is it so important to wait and collect the blood spot specimen 24 hours after birth? Shouldn't the blood spot specimen be collected as soon as the baby is born? 24 hours is the optimum time for collecting blood spots to reobtain accurate results on those tests. There are uh, three instances where we would like it drawn before that. One is if the baby's going to be transfused, then we would like it drawn prior to the 24 hours, and then a repeat done after the transfusion. Another time would be if the baby's going home within the 24 hours, and a third time would be if that baby's being transferred out to another hospital. Once a blood spot specimen is collected, does it need to dry before being sent to lab? Yes, it needs a minimum of three hours for drying time, and then it should be sent to the lab within 24 hours after being collected. And one of the um, items that we, that's available is what's called a drying rack, and that way you can put those specimens on there so that they're not touching anything, they're not on the bench, because any of those touching each other can cause contamination, or putting on a bench can cause contamination. And so you can set them in here, let them dry for three hours, and then send them. Keeping the, the specimens in a horizontal position while they're drying is important. Um, so the blood will dry uniformly. And also it gets them up off of the uh, bench top so that they won't get contaminated with anything. Sometimes it's not possible to collect blood from the baby's heel. Can other methods be used? The heel stick is still the preferred method. It's important not to do the arch, do the ears, do the fingers on the baby, because that's too dangerous. But the heel stick is still the preferred method, as long as you are not contaminating the filter paper in any way. Sometimes babies move around a lot when you're trying to collect the blood from the uh, baby's heel. And what are the best ways to get that blood? Can you use other devices to get the blood on the filter paper without scratching it? The heel stick is still the preferred method for dropping the blood on the filter paper. However, you could use a capillary tube. The important thing is to drop it immediately so it doesn't have time to clot and do not touch the filter paper with that tube or you will scratch it. Um, another item to keep in mind is do not use an anticoagulant tube because that will interfere with the results of the test. With newborn screening, we collect blood samples from preterm as well as full-term babies. And we know that sometimes with the preterm babies, there are some special considerations. Can you tell us about those? The preterm babies you can collect prior to 24 hours if you believe there's going to be a transfusion. And then if you do that, you would have to recollect after the transfusion. If it is not possible to do it before the transfusion, then you would have to wait, do it after the transfusion, but then another one eight weeks after that last transfusion. What are the most common reasons that the lab would consider the specimen unsatisfactory? Some of the most common reasons for rejecting a specimen would be layering. If you're dropping the blood, you don't want that blood to overlap one another. Uh, quantity not sufficient, be sure and check both sides of your form that the blood has soaked through on both sides of the filter paper. Quantity not sufficient would be also if there isn't enough blood, you just put a tiny little drop in that circle and we don't have enough to get a valid punch clotting. And the clotting is usually due if you're using a capillary tube 
and you're dropping it and you're leaving it in that tube too long and it starts to clot. Serum separation can occur if you're pumping the heel of that baby and you're dropping the blood, then you have the tissue being mixed in with the blood and the separation can occur. Contamination, you can have contamination when you take your gloves off while you still are working with the specimen, holding it even though you've collected the blood because your hand has oils or maybe you've had hand cream on it and that can cause contamination. And then one other item that once in a while will get an expired form. All the forms have an expiration date. So be aware of that, and um, that would be rejected if you used it. We realize you can't, you can't be perfect in collecting specimens, and, and uh, while this one certainly looks better as far as be, the circles being filled, we're not going to uh, dismiss it, all samples if they're, if they're not completely with, uh, filled within the circle. And uh, here's an example of a blood spot specimen where we consider it acceptable. We feel we're getting an, an adequate valid uh, sampling from it. What other steps can collectors take to make sure that the best possible specimen is sent to the laboratory? You need to check the information on the form, make sure that all of it is complete before sending it. You need to properly train the staff in collection and one of the tools that is handy for doing that training is the one that is um, from the Clinical and Laboratory Standards Institute. You need to dry that specimen, keep it away from bench tops. You don't want them touching one another and they need a minimum of three hours of drying time. Keep it away from heat, humidity, and sunlight. And then ship it off to your lab within 24 hours after collection. All right, so this is the login bench and this is where it all begins. So what happens when we receive these specimens in the lab is the staff evaluate the demographic information and make sure that we have certain key components like name of the baby, facility, and date of birth. Um, once we've verified that that information is available, then we evaluate the blood spot quality. And the blood is protected by this flap, so we pull this back and we evaluate the front, and then we flip it over and we evaluate the back. And if both sides are um, okay, then the specimen is then passed along based on one person's assessment of the blood. However, if one lab staff member looks at this and says, mm, I don't know, I think there's something wrong with this, the specimen is then independently evaluated by a second lab staff member. And based on their evaluation of the blood spot card, if both can agree that it is poor quality or unsatisfactory, it is then assigned poor quality or unsatisfactory. By following these important procedures, you are a critical first link to a healthy start in life. Accurate collection of blood spots allows laboratories to quickly identify potential congenital conditions. Together, you and the lab technician help ensure a healthy life for the new infant in a process known as baby's first test. To learn more about newborn screening, parents can go to www.babiesfirsttest.org. This comprehensive one-stop shop includes information about the screening process, a clickable map listing each state's newborn screening panel, and detailed information about the symptoms, treatment, and causes of these conditions. There is also a health provider section which includes a childbirth educator toolkit and an FAQ with the most common questions that parents have for their providers.